Welcome to this week's episode of the Human Enhancement Podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. We're also live streaming on Facebook. And I'm excited to have with us Chris Christopher Kelly, uh, who is similar in some ways to my background, a computer scientist by training, uh, but has started, dove deeply into the space of, you know, looking at the human body as something that to be tweaked and optimized for. So curious to learn about your, your story on how you transformed from uh, more of a software person to mm. a, a, a biological hardware person. Yeah. I know that you also run an awesome podcast and, and, a, and a health and wellness human performance business called Nourish Balance Thrive. So curious to explore all those different topics. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here back in San Francisco. It's been yes. a long time. I used to live in San Francisco a few years ago, yeah. and it's uh, fantastic to come so back. You, have, you obviously have an English accent. So mm. what's the story? How, you know. Yeah, okay. Well, start yeah. From the beginning. Tell, yeah, start from the beginning. Okay, yeah. So um, I have an undergraduate degree in computer science and then also one in electronics from Southampton University. And I worked in London for a short time after graduating. And I worked for Yahoo. And uh-huh. they were very gracious in bringing me over to Sunnyvale, the headquarters there in Sunnyvale, where I worked as a software engineer. And I think that move, I don't think I've ever felt very good my my entire life. But after the move, there was definitely a decline in my health. Mm. I noticed, and it, you know, it's kind of like that, that frog in wa- water, does it notice it boiling yeah. type thing. But then you get to this point where you're like, no, something's definitely not right here. How old were you at this point? Uh, so I was in my early 30s, okay. uh, late 20s, early 30s. And so it's supposed to be the peak of your life, right? You're supposed to be like very interested. I was a single guy, should have been very interested in women, wasn't. <laughs> when I did get lucky with women, like there was nothing going on. So erectile dysfunction was one of my wow. main complaints, which is... Late 20s, early 30s. I know, it's like, it's a, it's, a, it's a very strong... I've realized this now. This is one of the most powerful motivators for men to actually really get do to something okay. about their health. And quite often, as I've since found out, it's the canary in the coal mine. Hmm that when there's inflammation and the plumbing is not working, it's not just a problem that's localized to that particular area, the, the inflammation is systemic. It stands to reason, right? Like the body isn't trying to reproduce. If it, Reproduction functions just not probably the first. Right, In terms of right. Just maintaining homeostasis. Yeah, so there was lots of yeah. confounding factors. So I've always been active and loved to ride my bike. And when I moved to the US, I started to get really competitive about riding my bike. And everybody I met was really into road biking and We've just done an amazing <laughs> little loop around the headlands this morning. And it's an absolutely incredible place to ride road bikes. And then someone said to me, do you know what? You're pretty strong. You should do a race. And so I did. And I got a great result. And of course, I got addicted. And I got a coach. And I got more serious. And I started doing more cycling. And I'm sure that was a contributing factor to the decline of my de- performance. And in particular, I, I went the wrong way about fueling mm. that activity. So I now know that you should be very judicious with your use of carbohydrates for endurance performance. Right. And I was not. And I was eating cereal for breakfast. I was eating sandwiches for lunch. And you're slamming like goo pouches. and Every 40 minutes, just like it said on the back of the packet, every 40 minutes. And I couldn't go more than 40 minutes without one of those gels in the end. It was really not a great place to be. Huh. And if I didn't have it, I would have severe hypoglycemic symptoms. So... You know, for Muscle people listening, fatigue and-, fatigue and a lot of it is neurological, you know, like you'd be feeling like you're going to faint, you feel just uncontrollably hungry, really not a nice place. Hyperglycemia is not a joke. Yeah. Um, it's really not a nice place to be. And then um, I was hungry all the time, all the time. I was always thinking about foods. It's very hard to do, like I've just seen you guys next door sat there coding. Very difficult <laughs> to be in a flow state, if concentrating. You're if you're hungry all right. the time, you just can't do it. And so I got to the point where I was actually waking up in the middle of the night and I'd have to have that first big bowl of cereal at two o'clock in the morning. Well, you'd sleep at like 10, 11. Yeah. And go, you'd wake up hypoglycemic. Yeah, oh my wake God. up like a burst of cortisol or catecholamines or something in the yeah. middle of the night. I'm starving. I've got to have something to eat right now. And it takes you a while to so realize. Like super carbohydrate addicted. You'd, like most, yeah. yeah. So exactly. So very, very metabolically inflexible, completely dependent on glucose. Wow. And it just doesn't work. It's and, just and, no and way that, to exist. In, in that era, you were trained from your co- or, or, or in, the, in the milieu. Like you're gonna, you have to like carb load. Right. You have to eat a ton of carbs to fuel your cells. So that was like the milieu in which you were adopting right. this regimen. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I've since interviewed many 
top performers in, in this sports. Katie Compton is a the 13 times national cycle cross champion and I just interviewed her recently. Okay. And she's interesting because she, her, her sport, her activity, it predates any of this stuff, you know, like she can remember when the first power bar came onto the market right. and it tasted like shit. And she said, I'm not eating that. It tastes horrible. And she just always ate real food. She never succumbed. She never succumbed to the, to the marketing message and just never did any of that stuff. And I guess I turned up a little bit too late to the party. <laughs> so you just and thought that was a standard. I thought that was what quote. people did. Yeah. yeah. You know, like you take these goos and, you know, I'd mix up stuff in my bottles and right. it just turned me into a car burner of, of, of the worst type. And in the end, you know, I started and like, this is not good. And like, I, you know, I figured out so your you performance could... dipped, your libido dipped, Actually, your health dipped, or like, or like it was your performance improving. Yeah. But your health... So that was the thing was that I, I felt tired all of the time, apart from when I was on the bike. Okay. And actually that was when I felt my best was when I was warmed up on the bike. So okay. it would take me 60 minutes to warm up on the bike. But once I got warmed up, I actually felt pretty good. Okay. And so if that again became addictive is, you know, if you feel good doing this, then you're probably going to do more of it. Um, and, but yeah, I've started testing my blood glucose with a, the finger stick test. That I'm sure you're, you've seen many yeah, times yeah. and my fasting blood glucose was 120 milligrams per deciliter wow. consistently every morning. So that's basically almost diabetic. Yeah. Like it's not type good. two is essentially 125 and up. So you're basically yeah, diabetic. Yeah. That's the precipice right there. Yeah. And, you know, so with that, a lot of fatigue, insomnia, unable to sleep, you know, with this waking up in the middle of the night, erectile dysfunction, not able to concentrate at work at all. I'm just sat there in my gray cube in the office and there's just nothing going on. There's like fog behind my eyes. Jeez. I'm just staring at the monitor, nothing going on. Even if you like drink a lot of sugar, you're, you're, do you get no, any, I didn't, you, nothing? No, it was all, I, get, I find the same way with caffeine now actually, is it's not really um, you know, a boost, an ergogenic aid. It's really just returning me to a baseline. Okay. Uh, and so I use these things very judiciously now. Like I've yeah. just been away traveling and I drank a lot of coffee and now I've gone cold turkey on it yeah. again. So I know that I can have that yeah. boost again in the yes. future. It's like I've been a lot nice. smarter with my caffeine usage as well, right? If you just yeah. use it every single day, you, just you don't get the boost. Accustomed. Yeah. But like you want that boost at certain points. Yeah, like exactly. you actually, uh, caffeine is very strong. You feel it too. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I went to my primary care doctor, as you would. And actually the, 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 the motivator, the final straw, the thing that got me was being kicked off some girl's stoop, right? Sat in San Francisco. It's kind of bringing back some, <laughs> some bad memories, actually, being here, yeah. riding my bike and stuff. Um, what just, part of town? I'm curious. Uh, it was in um, the Mission District. Okay. I lived in the Mission District for a while, and, okay. and she had a really nice place over on just off of Valencia, I believe. Yeah, and sat there on the stoop, like 10 o'clock at night, and, you know, there should have been some action and no action took place. And she's <laughs> like, you need to go to a doctor and get this sorted out else it's over. And just thinking, shit, she's right. God, this is not good, is it? And so you know, oh. it's like the most awkward conversation to have with a doctor. I don't I just hated it. Yeah. Um, but actually they have, if, if the problem is a plumbing problem, then Viagra, and obviously there are alternatives now. Right. They, they work great, right? <laughs> you just take the drug and it solves the problem. Or does it, you know, right. and, and this was one of the things when I interacted with the doctors, having interviewed lots of engineers, you kind of get a feel, you know, within a few minutes of talking to someone, whether someone's really going to be any good on, on right. Monday morning. Sure. Yeah. And interviewing these doctors, y you start to think, you know, this guy doesn't really know what caused this problem, you know, I mean, I know he's got the drug that's going to solve this particular problem. But I also have all these other things, a lot of bloating, right. a lot of gas, a lot of diarrhea. But just solving the proximal symptom, not like the primal cause. Right. So you're just like, oh, right. here, here's uh, some Yeah, some so you got the, 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 the impression like, what's the fastest way I can get this guy out of my office? Yeah. And right? get paid for it. And get paid for yeah. it. And, and, and the drug was a really good way to do that. And so you said, okay, you've got some gut symptoms. You should go see the gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist was worse than useless. They said, it's nothing to do with your diet. We can do a colonoscopy, we can do an endoscopy, we can confirm what I've, you've already just told us, right? We're like not gonna believe your diagnosis, we're gonna do our own. Right. And then we've got some steroid anti-inflammatory drugs that can reduce the inflammation in your mm. gut. And when those stop working, and they will stop working, then we, we've got surgery for you. And, and that I mean, prognosis, you're like, damn, that's... Yeah, it didn't sound um, good, um, but I'm you know, still pretty young, and like they want to put me on steroids for the rest of my well, life. Well, a colostomy then... bag. Can you imagine that in your Jeez. early 30s? No thanks. Um, but to be honest, it wasn't really. You know, I hadn't really emerged from the brain fog, and I'm not sure all of it was really registering in the same way it would register with me now. And I was lucky that I had someone to pull me up by my bootstrap, which is uh, the woman who is now my wife. Okay. And she just finished her master's degree in food science. And she'd been studying food allergies, in particular dairy allergies in the lab. 
And, uh, you know, as soon as she heard this diagnosis from the gastroenterologist, she's like, you need to fire this guy immediately and try an elimination diet. And that elimination diet, you know, it was called paleo back then. It's funny, I'm, I f- it feels really weird saying this now, but the word paleo is sort of exist. going away. You know, yeah. it's like it's become untrendy now um, <laughs> to say paleo. And in particular, it was the autoimmune paleo diet that, that was fantastic So elimination diet, you were just removing one thing at a time from your diet. No, actually, you remove, that, you that remove would be the engineering from... approach. And, okay. and you, you very much, that's what I thought as well. was like, oh, okay, we're going to remove one thing at a time and we're going to figure out which is the culprit. You just went off, full off the cliff, everything out. We're going to put yeah. one thing back at a time. <clears throat> exactly. Okay. So you go the other way. Life okay. is too short and you won't notice that when you won't notice the, the signal in the noise. That's another engineering term, isn't yeah. it? It's like when there's so much noise, you can remove one thing that was potentially not making you feel good. And you won't notice because there's still too much noise. And so you just have to say, remove everything that's a potential allergen, gluten, dairy, nuts, seeds, nightshades even. And then just go back to eating a very minimally processed whole foods diet that consists of meat and vegetables and maybe some fruit and traditional bone broths and stocks. And I started eating organ meat and more fish. Okay. And felt fantastic. And I knew it was working because the whole time I was measuring C-reactive protein, which is a very simple, basic blood right. test that anybody can do. And it's probably already done. And mine went down from like seven, I think, down to less than 0.5 within a couple of weeks just from changing my diet. Wow. And then I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is like amazing. This yeah. is a true transformation. And of course... Like the I said fog earlier, lifted, the plumbing started working again, and everything. The fog lifts. <laughs> like it's very, very analogous, actually. The yeah. idea of the fog lifting above, you know, and this back was like from a couple weeks. Bridge. It's a couple weeks. Yeah, it was that. It was really that fast. The transformation, yeah. and then of course you start to wonder what else is possible, and that got me into the world of advanced testing. Oh, did you know there's not just these blood tests that your doctor has been running? Right. There's also stool tests. There's urinary organic acid tests. There's um, I did saliva hormone testing at the time. Yeah. Now in our practice, we use urinary hormones and that's because we get some more data that you can't right. get through saliva. But w- yeah, when I got into that, um, you know, I, I've been always been an evidence base. You know, it's either everyone else, medical doctors and everybody else is a quack, right? There's either, either, either there's clinical evidence or there isn't. Sure. And in the end, it was a chiropractor that was the other 50% of my recovery. Wow. Huh. Uh, his name's Dan Kalish and he's an amazing guy. And I just listened to him on a podcast and thought this guy really sounds like he's interested in investigating root causes. And I worked with him and he did a whole bunch of testing on me, the same similar testing to what we do in our practice now. And the stool testing I think was most enlightening and found pinworm infections, um, an amoeba, um, I so did you had some, you had, you had just actual yeah. parasites. So, I, so in the beginning, sorry, in the beginning, I thought it was all about diet, and if all yeah. I all I needed to do was fix my diet, and then the advanced testing showed me that actually there was a lot more to it than that. And you know where you got parasites from? I mean, that's that's concerning. Yeah, so it's an interesting question, and and I still don't know the answer. Right. I mean, I, well, I know the answer. It was contaminated water at some point, but it raises this very interesting philosophical question, which is which came first, the, the parasite or the unhealthy host, right? Were you already an unhealthy host and then you were just a sitting duck waiting for that contaminated water to come along? Right. And I think that's the answer. I don't think it's, you know, people always think, oh, well, it's like walking across the lawn and I stepped on a rake and it whacked me in the face and, and that's what happened to me. Right. And I don't think it's like that. I think I was making some very poor food choices. You made was, extra susceptible, susceptible to taking... Exactly. Yeah, so right. I think I'm over-exercising. Yeah. I'm competing in all these mountain bike racing. I'm suppressing my immune system. Because you're working out so hard. Working yeah. out so hard. And then eventually I just, you know, picked up something that anybody is exposed to. Some marginal to. water. And then, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. You go to the Whole Foods salad bar. Um, there's something there. Maybe you have a single bout of diet. I don't want to get sued by Whole Foods, <laughs> by the way, right now. But you, you know what I'm saying? It yeah. could be anywhere. Yeah. And you get a single bout of diarrhea. And then you're fine. And that's yeah. the end of it. And right. with me, it wasn't. It became a chronic, long-standing situation that then led to these all these other symptoms, insomnia, brain fog, lo- loss of libido, erectile right. dysfunction, all of these things. And so, you know, I'm sure there was a, a, a it was a sequence of things that happened, but it's, I, it's it definitely wasn't as simple as, oh, you just picked up a parasitic infection and all you right. needed to do was take some herbs to get rid of it. <laughs> I'm certain that wasn't the case. Wow. So you basically, it, it was from a... 
functional perspective where you're like, wow, wake up call. I need to like fix myself. And like mm. the traditional path in, in terms of what a doctor recommended didn't make any sense to me. Right. And then you started educating yourself and getting smart about the space. Right. Yeah. And so one of the early things I realized was that, and this is still true. And this is true for people listening is nobody cares about this problem more than you do. Yeah. Not your wife, not your doctor, no one. It's right. down to you. Um, you are the owner of this problem. Yeah. You're the project manager. Absolutely. I think that's like one thing that I think the culture is starting to shift. I think it used to be that you would you would delegate your your responsibility of your own own health to your doctor or to right. my parents. Right. Like just growing up, I, you know, I didn't really right. care about my vaccines or right. what I was going to get checked up on now. And then now it's like as you're older, it's like, oh, the doctor knows better than me. Right. And then it's like they don't, it doesn't matter. You're sleeping with like the, the, the hurting back. You're sleep. you know, you're waking up and moving around in your broken body. Right, right. Yeah, you feel like all the little kinks in it. Like, right. you know your body the best yeah. in a lot of ways. You are the keeper of the special yeah. information, as, yeah. as one expert said to me once. But yeah, yeah, so I could play devil's advocate right now and, and just play the role of that primary care doctor. Right. I walked into his office right. and he's thinking, I'm going to see 45 patients today. All of them are in worse shape than you look. In fact, you look <laughs> much better than I look right. and I feel right now. Right. And, you know, I, you're making some probably some shitty decisions with your right. diet, which is leading to the way that you feel right now get out of my office you right. know and so it's it's not fair to walk into a doctor's office and say here deal with this yeah in the same way as you do with your car right, right. Your car, your car, the engine check light came on here deal with this <laughs> right you can't do that with right. your health i think the incentives are also just interesting like talking to doctors i think doctors of course like want to do well mm. but the incentive system is interesting where they're not being billed that they, they only really make money off of drugs they prescribe right like right. you don't make money off of prescribing someone a healthier right. diet. So it's like the incentives are very interesting where yeah, I think each individual player is trying to do its best, right? Mm-hmm. Like I don't think the doctor is trying to like evil. be flippant or trying right. to just push out the door. It's like, you know, I, I have to pay my own bills. I have to like mm-hmm. get through my huge queue of people. What do I right. do to like optimize my local phenomenon? Right. So right. I think it's just like a very, so I, I'm hopeful that, you know, folks like yourself, you know, what we do with our community, just educate people around a little bit of more self-responsibility about, empowering yourself a little bit on how this all works right right yeah absolutely yeah. i think i think that's so important and you know i'd, I'd always wanted to start a startup and i was a big fan of you, you must be familiar with paul graham yeah why combinator. combinator yeah and i'd been reading his essays he was actually a yahoo and please his store builder company got by web yeah Vi- you remember? Oh my goodness! Oh yeah, because I did Y Combinator uh, for my first company back in 2011. Oh, that's amazing! So I'm such that was a huge yeah, fan. Yeah, of so I, I, I mean, it was interesting because I saw that whole evolution to now Y Combinator now is like this huge thing, this like Harvard of startups or whatever. And I think in 2011, it, it was a pretty big deal, but it wasn't like oh my god, Paul Graham is yeah. of startups. It was still like him in his shorts, and I think he wore Crocs or flip flops. He would make some. Cr- crappy chili and it would be kind of you know 60 companies and it's yeah. relatively small yeah and like he would say some smart stuff but like it was interesting it's, it's crazy to see that the mythos develop yeah know, sort of in, in front of us yeah yeah so i was working for yahoo yeah. in 2001 which is around the time i think he might have been gone from yahoo he might okay. have been doing his vest in peace yeah. um but i've been following his essays for a long time and one of the things he talked about was uh, one person a startup does not make. So I'd always been looking for friends that were potentially yeah. interested in starting a business. And I always thought that would be in software. I never thought it would be in a different industry. Right. And I found one of these pissed off doctors, right? Somebody who's on the other side of the table. Yep. And that was Jamie Kendallweed. Her, her name back then was Bush. But she's a pro mountain biker and a medical doctor. And okay. she just finished her residency. She was in $250,000 of student debt, started the job on day one. <laughs> And she's like, this sucks. This sucks. I'm yeah. going to see 30 people this morning. Yeah. And I'm supposed to fix them in seven minutes. <laughs> and I don't want to do this. But, but what am I going to do? I've got $250,000 of student yeah. debt. And so we had been riding. It was just a coincidence that we'd been riding bikes together occasionally. Uh, and she was competing doing UCI races. So she was. I got a pro license in the end after I recovered my health. But she was genuinely earning UCI points, a proper pro. And uh, we were like, yeah, let's 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 start a business. And, wow. Okay. Um, let's do this right. You right. know, let's do take an engineering approach to recovering people's health. Like, really understand so the root causes. So she quit her resident job. No, you can't do that. I so she's say continued that, to work okay. as a as a as a medical doctor all okay. this time, but um, just part time. And 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 she's been collaborating. She now lives in Bellingham in Washington. My company is all remote. There's okay. no office anywhere. Right. 
But that was this like, Genesis, where it was like these two like-minded folk that yeah. were connected over biking that wanted to change the system. Exactly, exactly. And so one of the other things that I think that Paul Graham has talked about is do things that don't scale. Yep. And the reason you made me think about that is the pharmaceutical industry, it scales, right? You can just sell a pill and maybe that yeah. person takes that pill for the rest of the, their life and yeah. you don't need to interact with them on an ongoing basis. And yep, you sign up someone for a lifetime value subscription, essentially, it's great. right? It's a great it's business just, model. Yeah. Whereas the problem that I saw that we needed to solve, it was a problem that didn't scale so that we were going to have to. So what Jamie wanted to do was sit someone down in their office, in her office and speak to them for maybe eight hours, maybe even more. Maybe she needed to talk to them every 15 minutes, twice a day. Right. Essentially you know, concierging out her expertise exactly, one at a time, which exactly. is like consulting. It's like, yeah, there's not scale in the sense it that it's still so linear to your amount of time that you have. Right. And so we were um, exchanging our time for money yeah. in, the, in the early days as consultants. And I knew that was a business that didn't scale. But, but it got I, the juices going. Exactly. So yeah. it gave me the confidence. Paul Graham's essays gave me the confidence to know do that things is, that don't yeah. scale. And, yeah. in, in, you know, in the end, you'll find a way to make it work. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think that's like, I think you either are a genius and you have a business model from day one, but I don't think, I don't think that's very true. I think most, if you look at the history of all these companies, they all just like are interested people hacking away, figuring out some stuff. And then they, they kind of modulate towards this, towards a scalable business model, right? Like right. Facebook was just like a joke of a right. product. Like, you know, Snapchat, there were, you know, the founders were at Stanford the same time we were at Stanford and they were just like making an app for a, a class and like it was kind of a joke right? right like these things weren't designed from day one having a brilliant business model but right. i think you just got to get something going right exactly like you have some customers you get some experience you know what's working for them like what value you're adding right so you got the got the ball rolling exactly, okay. exactly. so you got the ball rolling with like this essentially concierge like hands-on bespoke service exactly so every single person that walks in our door now uh, and they're all people like me it's kind of eerie you know i i mean you, you know a little bit about obviously sales and marketing and branding sure. and all of that so i went on to the some podcasts and, and talked about what happened to me and a whole bunch of people who were exactly the same as me uh, <laughs> came forward to work with us and said yeah this happened to me can you just fix me in the same way as you fixed yourself okay. and the answer is yes i can and so we do this similar root cause analysis where we're running a very advanced blood chemistry panel yeah what yeah what is the package i mean you've referenced yeah. it what is like the, the full pitch here how it works yeah so it's is it called nourish thrive balance uh, sorry nourish balance thrive yeah. i know it's a terrible name it's so hard to find a good name it's too long <laughs> and, and the words kind of sound like other things so yeah nourish balance thrive okay. is is the name of my podcast and then also the website and we run a program we call the elite performance program okay and it is designed for athletes for the time being so people who are motivated who are goal orientated, they know what success looks like. There's not gonna be a, a problem with compliance. So that I realize now that was quite unique about my situation is my wife said to me, you need to eat this diet starting tomorrow. And I was like, okay, All no right. problem. Yeah. Behavior change is one easy. of the most yeah. hardest, the hardest problems yeah. we know. Yeah. And so not everybody is like me. And so we're very lucky with these athletes that we work with now I can hand over recommendations and they'll just execute stuff. Like it's like top decile, top quintile folks in terms of motivation. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so there are some executives and then quickly we get into referrals. You know, maybe we'll work with someone who's an athlete and they're like, oh, you've got to fix my mum or my sister or my brother or my cousin. And those people rarely are also athletes. And right. so we don't just work with athletes, but primarily we do. But they've high incentive to stick to the routine because they've seen good results, hopefully. It's a with mixed the, bag. The... I'll be honest. It's a mixed bag. Sometimes you'll get people that have been shoved forward by the person who's had a phenomenal right. result like I did. And they're saying, oh, you've got to do this. And they're just appeasing the person right. who's making the referral. But other times they're not. They're just as committed. So okay. it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so someone walks in the door and the first thing we're going to do is that proper investigation like a mechanic would when you brought your car into the shop with the engine check light on right he's so gonna... like you do a blood urine yes. stool saliva exactly so that's kind of funny i did a 90 day biohacker challenge where i kind of pieced together my own and i worked with a friendly doctor that was able to help me prescribe all these tests so mm. I, I did like a full panel on my blood it's interesting so like it sounds like you have a like a bespoke service built around it but i kind of like pieced together my own sort of panel of stuff. Right. It's, it's, it's one of the, one of our value propositions is which are the tests. Right. There's a lot. I mean, I'm sure people listen to this have already looked and seen there are all these it. advanced yeah. tests yeah. that are out there. Yeah. Uh, which are the ones you should do first. Right. And the only reason I know is because you I worked studied with, all of them. <laughs> well, I have studied a lot of them, but 
honestly, the what I think my secret to where I've gotten so far, um, and this is again something I've learned from someone else. I'm pretty sure it's Zuckerberg said this, but okay. surround yourself with people who are better than you. Right. And and I think that's really really important. And, and just this year, I've I finally put the last person in place that I wanted. So now I've got a team who are all better than me, and in particular, Dr. Tommy Wood, who's one of Bree's uh, former colleagues at Oxford, uh, Oxford and Cambridge yeah. graduated uh, biochemist and medical doctor, research scientist, and lover of all things health and fitness. It's his job. It's his passion. It's what he lives yeah. and breathes for. And so he is constantly looking, you know, what this new test, what value, what clinical data right. is there to support that it's going to find problems that we can do something about. And so it's really his knowledge like in, re in refining, you know, which the, our blood panel was designed by him for endurance athletes. And so, yeah, that's part of, our, of what we do is like nice. cut straight to the chase for a particular yeah. sort of person. I'm not saying that, you know, these are the best tests for every single person on the planet. I'm saying these are the you best want to be tests. endurance athlete. Exactly. And be competitive. Yeah. And not necessarily, you know, we've definitely worked with some strength based athletes. Right. And in fact, Tommy and Megan, my, my two of, um, my two colleagues, they are more strength-based yeah. athletes. So we're not so what totally... Are some of the key, but I'm curious, what are some of the key, if you can share, what are some of the key <clears throat> ones that you look at? So I think that it's not sexy anymore, but blood glucose, I think, is probably the most important thing. And if I was like to just... Like fasted or like H1BAC? Like yeah, exactly. So all, we're looking... All the blood glucose-related ones? Yeah, so we're okay. looking for glucose tolerance overall. And, okay. and the simplest thing that you can test at home is obviously your fasting blood glucose. You can yeah. pick up a meter in Walgreens that will test that for right. just a few bucks. And the test strips are very inexpensive. And you'll I'm see curious. that so on So you, you were testing 120 milligrams right. per liter, which is basically right. diabetic range type 2 mm -hmm. diabetic what are you now i mean did you, you reverse your diabetes essentially yeah. so it's consistently 88 okay, now nice and um i think when i wake up i'm 86 yeah, that's which is perfect yeah. so i actually have some i can send you this the references for this there's some epidemiological data that shows a decrease in all cause mortality after correcting for several factors right. and the sweet spot is 83 to 88 milligrams per right. deciliter so that's so that's pretty cool right yeah. i can give you the references for the okay, for yeah it'd be interesting for the show notes so if you want it, people listening that you want to test your fasting blood glucose if you're um, above that it, it, to be honest there doesn't seem to be much bad that happens below uh, that 83 right 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 but above 88 you definitely start to see some some bad things happen and so if you're seeing that the thing to do next is to to dig deeper, right? That's right. when when it doesn't work. Right. It's not working for me. Yeah, I want to give people the, the sense that like typically the medical ADA recommends that 125 is a threshold for di right. diabetes. <clears throat> Over 100 is considered pre-diabetic. Right. Um, under yeah, but 80. who isn't pre-diabetic today? That's yeah, I, th I think I'm saying everyone is pre-diabetic. Right. So yeah. those reference ranges is important to understand where generous. they come from. Yeah. Right. So it could be that the people, so for smaller tests, what happens is they develop the assay and they test a few people in their office and then they just calculate two standard deviations either side of the mean. Yeah. And then they pass that test that they've developed over to someone like LabCorp or Quest and then right. that becomes the reference range. Right. And in some tests that are done more often than that, then the, the cohort would have been bigger, but they're not necessarily healthy. So for, for glucose, for example, it could be 7,000 people who have done the test over the last two years. We're right. going to calculate that bell curve, two standard deviations. That's 95% of all the people that did the test. But we know <laughs> now that two thirds of people in Western countries like the US are now, are now pre yeah, So, yeah. okay, so great. Now you fall right in the middle of, of the pre-diabetic pre range. People. And right. like, yeah, half of us are overweight obese. Like, it's not like you want to be an average American. No. Being an average American no. is not that, is like bad. No, so, exactly. So you want to be like top quartile, top decile of like healthy range yeah, to super, actually super be tight. healthy. Yeah, yeah, so most most things in physiology, there's a sweet spot, yeah. right? Like less is not necessarily better, yeah. more is not necessarily better. You're looking for that sweet right. spot, and it's 83 to 88. And if you're not seeing that, I mean, so we run this on everybody that walks right. in the door. We're not going to like screw around. Yeah. And so that's one of the things I've learned is it's better to do, in my opinion, it's better to do too much testing than too little. Like I would rather have all of the information right now yeah. and know what to do I, next. I, rather I, than I think that's actually controversial from a medical perspective. It I've is, had doctors say like, no, you don't want that information because no, exactly. like it's going to confuse you and scare you. Yeah. And just like as an engineer, you're like, what? That doesn't like, make sense like, to me. You, you have more data so you can actually make a better decision. Like why hide data unless, of course, like you need to educate people on how the data actually works right. and how it correlates. Like, But like I don't, but the sense of like, oh, you're too dumb to like understand your own data. We're not going to tell you. We're going to like curate it for you. It seems very. Offensive. Uh, offensive. Yeah. Very, <laughs> very big, you know, big government. Very. I don't know. It just, it just, 
counter to, this is counter counter to like what America is about like, in terms of right. freedom and responsibility. Yeah, it's point. also just counter against like what like the internet revolution has shown, right? Like information access has only increased over time. Right. Right. And I, I, and I see the same thing happening with biological data. I right. think that was, that is what is driving a lot of the biohacking interest today. Like you see uh, cryptocurrencies, democratizing access to financial instruments. You have yeah, internet democratizing information access to, you know, you have, more data about the history of the world than ever with Wikipedia, mm. et cetera. I and think the same thing is going to happen with health. And it is. And we're seeing this LabCorp, Quest, the two major US blood chemistry providers right. are moving to this direct-to-consumer yeah. model. So yeah. you're not going to need somebody's permission to go run some of the markets. So for glucose, for example, we're looking at fasting insulin, yep. C-peptide, which is a more reliable marker than right. insulin. We're looking at glycomark, which is a very interesting molecule that you can measure in blood. I won't go into the details, it's kind of complicated, yeah. but know that the, the name is glycomark is a trademark. Um, and then we also look at uh, triglycerides. Okay. Um, so well, you, really, you really look at the, the core metabolism of a Right, person. so I'm talking, this is specific to glucose, a, a HbA1c, yeah. of course, which right. is a marker of average glucose as well. So right. we're you know, like taking a really deep dive just on this one thing, which has kind of become a bit unsexy now. In my world, where we're talking about the ketogenic <laughs> diet right. um, all the time, it's become a bit uncool to talk about blood glucose. Why? <laughs> it seems like it's such, a, it's such an important part of it. Right. Of actually doing the ketogenic diet properly. Right. Yeah. I so mean, I, I think it's just because that people are attracted to new and shiny things. Oh, they care you know, about like, measuring blood ketones or something? Well, no, it's because people move on to things like, um, you know, maybe it's a condition like, uh, so maybe one day it's candida, the next minute it's, 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 it's MTHFR, okay, the next minute okay. it's a parasitic infection, the next minute it's chronic Lyme, or maybe there are uh, substances that people move I on see. to, right? So, But like the know, tried and true seems, it's, it's Again, yeah. metabolism is so fundamental to how our body yeah. produces and stores Unless energy. you can sort this out, it's it's almost like... It seems to be the most primal thing to like mm -hmm. look at. Right, I right. I should probably talk about some of the solutions, shouldn't I? People are going to be super annoyed if I talk about... <laughs> no, oh, I think it's interesting. Yeah, it's cool. you have all the, <laughs> all the input, so you, you get all the data on someone. Right. Yeah, what's next? Yeah, so I talked about obviously removing some of the, the gut. So this is one of the things that I've learned recently, and this may be a reason why the ketogenic diet doesn't work, is that if you have a gut full of endotoxins, so that's kind of a fancy word, and all it means is some bacteria have the, the ability to either produce or contain things which are toxins in the gut. Okay. And in particular, proteobacteria, they have these things embedded in the cell wall called lipopolysaccharides or LPS, and um, they're, 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 they're always in these, these protea, this specific class of bacteria. And so if you have a gut full of these protea bacteria and you slam a bunch of saturated fat down there and you maybe stop eating some fiber and you piss them off because they were eating the fiber, then you can end up getting really terrible results mm -hmm. on, on a ketogenic diet. And so that make, may make you feel worse. And so I think that doing the testing and cleaning up my gut was one of the key things that I did. But I also stopped eating so much refined carbohydrate. Right. Obviously, that was also very so important. So would one say that you would alter someone's gut microbiome? Yeah, yeah, I think in, you can do in, that. In, in advance of prescribing or suggesting a ketogenic diet? Yeah. Or, 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 or what would be the protocol? Yeah, so we, we've we actually had a bunch of people recently. Last summer, I, I organized this. I didn't organize it. I hosted this event called the Keto Summit, mm -hmm. where I interviewed 30 plus experts on the yeah, ketogenic diet. Yeah, I saw diet. some of the clips. Yeah, and so, um, you know, that gave me uh, tremendous insight, but also a whole bunch of clients, right? So people yeah. who had tried the diet and they'd gotten worse. Maybe they'd gained some weight or started developing some neurological symptoms. Mm, wow. And so we saw a bunch of these people and, and, and Tommy came up with the idea of a, what he called the pegan diet, which was like, like the vegan diet in terms of the amount of plant material. So most of what you see on your plate is plants. Yeah. And then you're eating a decent amount of protein still, but you're keeping the fat very, very low. Hmm. And this is like counter to everything everyone else is talking about. But that's the reason is because your gut is full of vipers. You don't want to translocate those endotoxins into the lymph, into the blood supply where huh. they're then going to cause you problems. And it's, you know, one of the important things I've learned over the, over the years is that, um, you know, the thing that gets you out of trouble is not necessarily the thing that's going to help you for perpetuity. perpetuity. So the, a good example is crutches, yeah. right? Like you don't, you know, you break your leg, you're on crutches for a few months, but you don't keep using the crutches after your leg is healed, right? Yeah. So, well, I that, think it's like, yeah, you, you use an intervention for a use case. Right. I think right. people that suggest, hey, like ketogenic diet 
24 7 for the rest of my life like yeah it's yeah. good for some use cases right. but it might not be the best if you're trying to bulk up muscle right or do a lot of sprinting right, right? like there are just trade-offs to biology. right there's no right. like everything is trade-offs i think it's a personalized to your own personal genetics and then your 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 use cases like mm. are you trying to optimize for aerobics right are you trying to optimize for longevity right like right. you're trying to build a lot of muscle like they all would require different types of right protocols right yeah so typically these yeah. people they would come with a weight loss goal okay and uh, maybe they'd have some other complaints like i did fatigue insomnia yeah. that sort of thing and, and the ketogenic diet made them feel worse right and so they do this temporary intervention the very low fat diet simultaneously we're manipulating the gut microbiome and we're doing it in a very crude manner i would say okay. like the, the gut microbiome is ridiculously complex yeah. as i'm sure you know yeah i mean people um, have been talking about like fecal transplants a little bit oh so yeah, yeah we're not we can talk about that but um yeah we're <laughs> definitely not going to that 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 yeah, it's a hurry so. shifting people's gut microbiome. yeah so we're doing a traditional stool culture so a microbiologist is looking at a sample underneath a microscope okay. and they're looking for you know, parasites, amoebas, worms, and then they're also looking for overgrowth of specific bacteria. So yeah. what they do is they put some of the sample onto a growth medium, and then they leave it for a specific amount of time, and they count and the count amount the of count how yeah. much of the growth medium is covered, and yeah. then they tell you how much of the the bacteria is there. And so you can have certain things which are opportunistic pathogens that can be overgrown. Hmm. So things like Citrobacter. Um, Club Ciella, Enterobacter, some of these things, when overgrown, can become problems. And you can take um, herbs that will um, do a really good job of um, getting rid of these bugs. Um, and, that, and then you, with the dietary intervention, it's like a temporary thing. And then right. you can go back to maybe a, more, a higher fat diet later on. But you've got to get rid of the vipers okay. before you can. One of the analogies I use, which I think is maybe more appropriate, is that of uh, the garden. So in the beginning, imagine you've got this allotment right. and you want to grow some vegetables and it's kind of overgrown and there's tons of weeds in there and stuff. You can't just throw down a bunch of fertilizer and seeds and hope right. it's all going to be good, right? You've got to go in there and do some weeding yeah. before you can expect Makes that sense. garden to yeah. grow. And yeah. so we do the same thing. We do the testing. We find the weeds. We go in with some herbs. Very occasionally, we have to make a doctor referral because we've got we found something you that you can't. Like probiotics or anything? Or? We do use probiotics okay. as well as part of okay. the intervention. So that's like kind of your weeding, and then we do seeding, which is fertilize um, it with exactly. So prebiotics we found to be very helpful. Okay. Uh, things like acacia, glucomannan, inulin. Um, there's some other things as well, some fibers. So, so but the long term solution with certainty is uh, a wide variety of vegetables in your diet. Right. Um, so you just go to the farmer's market. If you see something, you don't know what it is, buy it. Google search it when you get home. That's Eat what it. you should be eating yeah. to have a healthy gut microbiome. Right. Rinse and repeat. Eventually, you're going to run out of things. But basically, anything that looks like an onion contains inulin. And the good bacteria love to eat inulin. So, but it's in, you know, what we were saying earlier is, it definitely applies is that the, you know, the skills that get you out of Egypt are not necessarily the ones that get you to the promised land. Right. And if you throw a bunch of inulin on top of Club Ciella, you're going to feel shit, right? So you've really got to do that weeding before you get to the seeding parts. Okay. The, the order of things is important. Interesting. So you basically, you reprime, rebuild someone's gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. You take them on, a, you, you put them on a low fat, uh, medium, I guess, me higher protein diet because there's not much else. You're eating low fat and low carb. Right, right. It's just like a protein yeah, diet. It's definitely not skimping on protein. Um, Okay, and, th and then from there, then you optimize towards someone's end goal. Right, yeah. So we're, we're, we're looking at using all urinary organic acids and we'll find nutrient deficiencies okay. on those. So any of the B vitamins, you can detect those with an organic acids okay. test now. And we find people deficient in, in B vitamins all the time. I was just looking at some of your products just a right. moment ago. And I noticed it had tyrosine in it. And we, we right. measure homovalinate, which is a, a breakdown product of dopamine. Okay. And we see that really, really low all the time. And I admit that... You don't really know. We've not measured the amount of dopamine that's present inside of the central nervous system, right. say. But we've measured this metabolite that's given us a good idea of what might yeah. be going on. And we recommend tyrosine as a, a precursor to dopamine yep. that can really help with the way that people yeah. feel, like their ability to concentrate and Absolutely. their mood and their the likelihood that they're going to get up and go do something interesting definitely increases when they take tyrosine. Yeah. But then there are the cofactors, right? So you need B6 as a cofactor. Right. So it's a pretty simple molecule dopamine, right? It's a neurotransmitter. You've got to make it quickly. It can't be big and complicated. And so you've right. got to be able to make it quickly. But it does have some nutrient cofactors, and B6 is one of them. Right. So you could have enough tyrosine. Tyrosine is an amino acid that you eat in meat or 
comes from your diet. But then you also need these cofactors like B6 in order to make the dopamine. And if you're deficient in B6, then theoretically you could then become deficient you're, in dopamine. Yeah. You're limiting like the production. It's like a supply chain, right? If you're missing components, yeah. it, it can only be produced as fast as the limiting factor. Right. So I think that's a really smart move with yeah. your product to to put the, the B6 in together. there because yeah. yeah, you know, we see people with a deficient in B6 all the time. Yeah. And and so it's 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 super important. I'd still take a multivitamin to this day because I really don't want a nutrient deficiency, right? It's a really bad thing to happen. And right. the problems associated with nutrient excess are, are relatively minor. B6 is actually a rare example where you can get neuropathy if you take too much of right, it. But, right, right. but you really have to go mad in order to have too much of it. And yeah. so uh, yeah, so we look at we look at neurotransmitter turnover. Um, we look at some other microbes. Yeah, what is the best way to measure neurotransmitters? I remember looking at that, and obviously the best way is to tap your central nervous system, but no one wants to do that. Right, so you, you either do like saliva practical. or urine. And I know that there's like some conflation there. Like, do you have any opinion around what is the most accurate way to tell? Yeah, you're right. So the, the, well, the, really the only practical and accurate way is, is through the urinary organic acids. Okay. And they measure some others as well. So you can look at serotonin. Right. You can look at dopamine. Um, and those are the... T oh, and uh, of course, the metabolites of dopamine, like um, epinephrine and norepinephrine, right. or adrenaline, as we call right. them in the UK. Um, but yeah, there's some urinary uh, neurotransmitter tests which are not valid. So some of the neurotransmitters are made locally in the kidneys. Right. And you can measure them in but urine. But that also produces neurotransmitters, and it's like easy to conflict whether it's like... Central was nervous it, system exactly or is it like a gut so there are, in a way you yeah. could argue that they those tests are a valid test like measuring dopamine in urine is a valid test there you know that yeah. is real dopamine and it was in the urine we're not right. lying to you about that <laughs> it's just not clinically relevant because you what you care about is the the dopamine that was inside of the central nervous system or right. the brain well it just depends on what you're looking for yeah, yeah. well i just don't see how it be what how is it? I, I don't know of an application i don't know how it's clinically relevant to to measure dopamine in urine um, sure so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody listening to that will tell me why yeah. it's interesting to look at dopamine and urine. But certainly for our other people that we work with, what they really care about is the dopamine in their central nervous system. Right. Yep. I mean, that's what people typically use that for, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a good proxy for mm -hmm. what's actually happening in the CNS. Mm -hmm. But like, again, you're not getting spinal tapped to like draw out. No, like, that's not practical. Brain fluid. Uh, yeah, it's painful and like yeah, not practical. Yeah, and so but that's so what's I nice about it, the yeah. urine test is you can do it at home and then you freeze it and then you FedEx the sample right. into the lab and then they send you back the result right. on a PDF form. And it's, yeah, obviously a lot better than <laughs> going into a lab and having some procedure done. Yeah. Cool. So basically, like, it, it sounds like a pretty bespoke service around um, getting the right lab result or getting the specific lab criteria that actually matter for mm. a specific end use case. And then, like, just fairly bespoke, I guess, protocols for each type of person. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. So behavior change is generally the hardest problem. Most people yeah. are not like me. And changing your behavior is a hard thing to do. Yeah. And in my experience, one of the most powerful motivators that leads to behavior change is a little bit of feeling better. Yeah, yeah. Like the first time you feel a little bit better, yeah. you're like, hell yeah. yeah. Okay, for the first time, this is actually working. Yeah. You know, I ate what the cardiologist told me, the low fat yeah. diet, and I felt like crap. <laughs> and for the first time, I feel good. Yeah. And that is really a strong catalyst for yeah, behavior change. Yeah, I'm curious change. about like your experience with keto. So you mentioned that you ran a keto summit. Yeah. I saw... Uh, yeah, an awesome list of researchers from Oxford yeah. and around. I mean, it's a really great, that. great list. I'm curious. Um, sounded like, what? Is, yeah, what is your current opinion in the space? I mean, there's a lot of emerging research around cyclical ketogenic diets, ketogenic diets, good for this, good for that, maybe not good for that. Like, there's a lot of emerging research like happening right now. Like, what is your current right. summation, if you will, of, of the space? Like, do you, are you are you eating keto? What is your current regimen? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I should probably point out that I'm not an expert. I'm more, like I said, the chairman of the board where I've spent a bunch of time talking to people who are experts, Yeah, which is a nice place to be. Which is also, I think, an advantageous position in some ways to collate this for. Right. I mean, like, you can... hey, what is the practicals for, you know, the audience or for myself? Right. Or right. You know, I have some opinions, of course, like in a similar position, not necessarily being, you know, the first author on a paper but like being able to in right. a position where you can talk with multiple right. first authors across different uh, you know agendas right and yeah and but we have worked with a thousand people over the past four yeah. years so we do have i say we not the royal we but the people i work with yeah. at nourish balance side so collectively we do have a lot of clinical experience i yeah. think now with the diet yeah and I was, I'm sure you're aware of Dominic D'Agostino yeah. and his work. And I can remember that early interview on the Bulletproof radio yeah. podcast. I was like, wow, this guy's amazing. And this sounds <laughs> incredible. I have to try it. Yeah. And so I did try it. 
And initially, I felt like there was a real cognitive boost. Like I felt more productive. I felt like my energy was more stable. Yeah. I really felt good. And on the bike, it was kind of indifferent. Although I did notice I had this incredible ability to go very, very long distances with no energy, no food whatsoever. You know, I could yeah, do... How strict were you? Were you eating like an 80, 20... Yeah, so they would diet. call it a modified Atkins, you know, it's not the classical ketogenic diet, but one that's higher in protein, uh, not really skimping on, on vegetables. I'm not really measuring too high on bl Ketons. blood, beta, hydroxybutyrate, okay. you know, maybe only, you know, 1.2, I think was the highest number I ever saw. On the diet. On, on the diet, but okay. I would never really dip below 0.5. It's sort I mean, of that's pretty good. That. That's pretty good. So, so like I was most definitely... People that are on keto i actually just measure them i'm like let me let me actually test you yeah like, oh, 0 0.3 i'm like nah, no you're, you're fucking it up <laughs> yeah 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 so um you know i felt a lot better but for a while i think i was in denial about what was happening to my exercise performance so in particular the mountain bike races you know you'd be feeling great i'd be feeling on top of the world my right. legs fan fan fantastic the gun would go off everybody would disappear like all of the people i was used to beating they were gone like literally out of sight gone right. I'm like, what the heck? I can't, I could you go harder. Good, but... Yeah, I feel good. I could go harder, right. but I'm going to, you know, I, only for 20 seconds and then I'd have to slow down. So right. something has changed here. Right. And then, so since then I've interviewed numerous top athletes that have said the same thing. Jeremy Powers said it on my podcast. He's a former national cyclocross champion. Right. Katie Compton said the same thing. It's like you've lost your fifth gear. Right. I can go all day. I feel fantastic. I'm not hungry. It's a superb tool for help to help me improve my body composition, which is right. a big deal to me because I earn my living. The sprinting power But yeah, gone. the top, the top yeah. gear has gone. Yeah. And so um, it's, it's not ideal. And so now I've gone back to the original diet that fixed me in 2014, which is... Uh, a paleo type diet, whole foods, I'm still eating a reasonable amount of carbohydrates, 75 to maybe 150 grams maximum right. of carbs per day. And those carbs are coming from starchy root vegetables. How long were you eating keto? Because I think- Two so, years. So, okay, so you yeah, were- so that is, I, so yeah, you're, you're fully keto adapted. Yeah, I think exactly. Some of the, like the devil's advocate would be, oh, you, you, you only yeah. were trying keto for a That's week. That's a very Your valid argument. Your not adapted fully to using keto yeah. as a fuel. And so you were fully- yeah, yes, no, 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 I don't think there's any question that I was, that I didn't give it enough time. And we, that is a very valid criticism right. of, of some recent, you know, we, people keep citing this study that was done by um, Burke, uh, B-U-R-K-E, right. of, yeah, yeah, yeah. spe of the speed runners. Right. And I think it was a three week study or something right. like that. And it, I, I just can't believe that anybody funded that, you know, it's like. <laughs> you, well, it, I don't think people understand how long it takes perhaps well, I, to I mean, get adapted. So the thing that blew my mind about that study was that I, nothing good can happen in that time. Like the only, when, in a three week study of athletes, the only thing that can happen is them is them get worse. You can either do a taper right. and, and their performance will improve or you can make a change to their current training routine and they'll get worse. Right. But certainly three weeks to expect somebody to become fully keto adapted. Yeah, I felt like it took over a year right. for me to really felt like, you know, I'd reached my full potential right. on the diet. And that full potential was not as good, as great in my particular sport of mountain biking and cyclocross as it was eating a mixed diet. Interesting. Yeah, because I think there's, I don't know if a, it was a Burke paper, but I remember reading some literature around, uh, from an aerobic perspective or super ultra endurance, like keto might be better, but in terms of, or, or like you catch up, like it, it's like equivalent fuel from a keto, keto relate, a ketogenic diet versus like a mixed diet. Right. Was that, was that the very long, long tail? Right. Like there's no performance differences. Right. So you're not expecting gains, but you're not expecting. Yeah. So and and I, that was, so I think it's yeah. Like so nominal. yeah. So yeah. Finney's original oh, study yeah, in cyclists yeah. in, in the yeah. 1980s, where okay. he didn't show performance improvement. He right. showed that they just didn't get worse. Right. Right, and right. so it was like a proof of concept. And right. I'm not really sure that anyone's shown that the diet, I mean, maybe there are some events. So we, we've definitely spoken to some Ironman triathletes. Right. That, I think the ultra marathoners are seeing. Exactly. So you got to go all day. If you're doing yeah. 24 hour endurance events, it's, I mean, it's, genius like you just cannot get enough calories on board right. so if you can just utilize the ones you already have then yeah that is genius but yeah it does open uh, oh and of course the other thing is like okay so let's say we don't care about sports performance we just care about longevity right. that's a different question and that's a different question right. and you know, a few of the people on uh, the keto summit in particular brian walsh is a naturopathic doctor that i talk about a lot on the podcast because okay. he's amazing and i don't have any financial affiliation with him or anything like that he's just a person that we love and we've yeah. learned so much from 
And in his Keto Summit interview, he presented a whole bunch of biomarkers that he'd noticed in some of the studies had changed in ways that he didn't think was good. Hmm. So for example- On a ketogenic diet. On a ketogenic diet. Okay. So for example, he looked at bilirubin, which has been shown to be an antioxidant. And then he okay. also looked at GGT, which is a classically regarded to be a liver enzyme. Okay. And these things can also, it's, can also be regarded as an antioxidant. And so what you see is in the beginning with the ketogenic diet, these people look like they're getting better, but over time it looks like they're getting worse. Hmm. And so he said he's a very, very humble guy. He's not, I'm not here to tell you that the diet is bad. I'm just here to tell you that I have some questions some that, I, I, that, that somebody needs to answer. Right. And then when you take a step back and you look at just physiology or biology in general, when have you ever seen it that more of the same gets a better result, right? So biology is about cycles of light and dark yeah. and of heat and cool and of rest <laughs> and and training yeah. it's it's never about oh if you just you know deadlift your your max one rep every day you're going to get better and better, and better and right. better it's, it's never works like that right. and so why would it be true with fasting or with the ketogenic diet right so i think that's what the the end answer so periods of 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 yeah, ketosis exactly. could be beneficial I, yeah, exactly. but I, yeah, that's i think a lot of like the current discussion within our group at human around yeah i mean i think when we do fasting like we do that you know and in, in, we're not doing like seven day fast every you know every week right that's mm. you just starve right. Um, right. so i think it's like how do you cycle going to ketosis and out of it i think that mm -hmm. seems to be uh you 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 touch the best of all aspects of different fuel types, right? right? Like sugar, like carbohydrates are not, I think, are overly demonized. Fats were overly demonized for a long right. time, and it, and I think it's like, let's not be dogmatic on any of these things. Like there's just like real data on each of these things, and they they're useful for each of the individual use cases. Like what is your use case? What is your baseline? Where do you want to go? And like, let's talk from there. Right. I think it's a sensible thing to do. Right, and that was another thing. So Chris Masterjohn's a fantastic PhD nutritional yeah. biologist that's done some amazing work. And he was one of the experts on the Keto Summit. And he was yeah. one of the, like maybe three people that raised concerns. And that was what he said. It's like, there's a real danger here of us it's changing one nutritional bogeyman for another, yeah. right? We've already been here with fat, right? Do you yeah. want to go there again with carbs? Like, right. did that get us anywhere useful? No, <laughs> it didn't. So yeah. you have to be careful, I think. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think it's like, I, I, I would say that there's probably, if there is a bogeyman, just like, like super refined carbs, like just like pure glucose right, or something, it's right. probably, I would right. say safely, like not good for you. Yeah, I think there's I, some I think... clear ones, but I think it's like, okay, do we just take out all leafy vegetables and, and, and it's like, probably not. You probably want, yeah. you know, some fruits and vegetables in your diet. Yeah, we have to be very careful, don't yeah. we, when we say things like, use words like carbohydrate. I mean, what do you mean? That's like yeah. a very large class of things. You yeah. have to be very specific. Yeah. yeah, so when I say that, I've reduced the amount of carbohydrates in my diet and I've gotten great results with my health with that. Right. I mean, I cut out the refined carbohydrates. Right. I cut out the breakfast cereal. I cut out the bread. Right. I cut out the pasta. Do you and try I to go into ketosis anymore? Like, do you try to cycle in? Do you do I any just don't measure it. Do you know, I've, I, I really don't. So I, I'm sure that I do. Um, so for example, my morning routine now is like I wake up in a fasted state and I go out and I do a 20 minute walk with my dog. Okay. Um, and that's partly because I want to get the bright light exposure and train my circadian okay. rhythm. Yeah. And it's partly because I want to push that fasted state just a, a little, little bit more. Yeah. And I'm not doing anything strenuous by any means. You know, my, t my three year old girl could keep up with me yeah. at my walking pace. I'm not walking fast yeah. and it's only for 20 minutes. Yeah. It just pushes that just a little bit more. And I'm sure right. if I measured my blood ketones when I got back, they would be between you know 0.6 and, and one millimole i'm sure and, and then, then when's, I eat. when's your last meal oh so uh like eight seven six p.m no so uh, that's another thing called blimey you're opening another can of worms here that's uh, like a big one but really important probably we've just got back from a conference in iceland that one of the doctors i work with tommy yeah. who i mentioned earlier we organized this conference on longevity in iceland and we had uh sachin panda who's done some incredible work on circadian rhythm okay and his, one of his experiments was on, well, many of his experiments are on time-restricted feeding. Yep. And he has an app that allows you to take pictures of your food and timestamp it. And so it turns out that eating is one of the most important things that entrains circadian rhythm. Okay. And in particular, it becomes more important when you lack the normal light cues. Okay. Right. So humans, you think about it, in, in years gone by, you wouldn't have had electricity. You would have had 
maybe sun. firelight yeah. and the sun yeah. and that's it and yep. then when it gets dark you go to bed yep. and that our dna has involved in that environment and then we right. invented electricity and you can put lights on at any time of the day we're in an office building right now you're just like this yeah. is ambient forever 24 7 it, yeah. exactly exactly so the, these this light cue has gone away and that puts more emphasis on other things that entrain circadian rhythm yeah. and one of them is eating and so when you eat you're doing the same thing you're telling your brain that now is the daytime yep and Sachin's work has shown that you can see improvements in metabolism when you restrict the feeding window. And it's interesting because mice, when they do experiments in rodents and they restrict their feeding window, right. they just eat more and to compensate for the fact they've got less time to eat in. Right. But in humans, they tend not to do that. They mm. tend to spontaneously reduce calories. Interesting. But one of the interesting things he talked about at the conference was that every single study that's been done that restricted calories, it also restricted the feeding window. Okay. And it could be it's nothing to do with uh, calorie restriction. And actually, it's the circadian rhythm thing that's right. leading Insul to these... Yeah, or, or just like reduce or reducing the amount of like elevated insulin in your system. Exactly. So, right. so, so to go back and answer your question, I eat as soon as I... So I do this 20-minute walk, get home. It's actually kind of hard now because if you notice, it gets dark, it gets light really late now. <laughs> like, I used to get light at 5 o'clock in the morning yeah. and now it gets light at 7 o'clock in the morning. It's hard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I get home and then I e eat. I do notice um, that. I wake up at six on monday and wednesdays to do some boxing so okay yeah, so yeah it is dark, the clock it is dark like, then like, what, oh, what's huh? going on it's yeah. like is it the middle of the night still yeah. did i wake up in the middle of the night um and yeah then we eat our last meal at four o'clock in the afternoon okay. and then i'm done with food until until i repeat okay. the cycle a solid the like 15 16 hour mm, yeah, yeah yeah i guess i guess it is i've not thought about that but yeah so they so sachin has done um experiments where he's looked at different feeding windows yep. Um, and he's not gone below eight hours. I think if you go too, if you compress it too much, you get to the point where you have to restrict calories just because you right. can't eat enough food. Right. And so you may then see deleterious effects if you do keep doing that forever. Um, but yes, yeah, so some amazing work that's showing some fantastic. It's definitely part of a, one of our, our go-tos now. If someone comes to us and says, I have a weight loss goal, I have a fat loss goal. Yeah. That's what they really, nobody really wants to lose weight. They want to lose fat, yeah. right? One of the first things we're thinking about is okay, time restricted eating. When, when yeah, it's actually it's actually one of the most popular protocols in our fasting community. Okay, like eighteen six eating six hour eating window. Right, hour. But the timing is so important. So yeah. that's the thing that I've but seen. I think, I, but I think you're you're right. Like time it with the day, which is exactly, actually like yeah. So you stack so some of these interventions together. Exactly. So people when they when as soon as you say intermittent fasting, people think skipping breakfast, right. and that's not what I'm talking about. Mm. I eat. You, if anything, so the the old saying goes: you eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like, dinner a, like a pauper, or, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. or something like yes, that. Yeah. That's the strategy that you're looking for to see the improvements in metabolism. And then it seems like once you get the improvements in metabolism, the the, the people who need to lose weight they just spontaneously lose weight, and the right. people that don't they just stay weight stable. Right. Um, so yeah, some really fantastic work to look at. And he's got some really interesting interviews online. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to kind of wrap up here. Like, what are the most exciting things that you're looking forward to? I mean, I think it sounds like you're you're just very well, broadly up to speed person. Like, it was a great conversation. I enjoyed this a lot. I Thank think you. I, I think Likewise. our audience probably learned a lot as well. You know, how can how can our folks follow you and, and what's on 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 the horizon for you? Yeah. So the main things on the horizon for me now are behavior change and finding purpose in your life and doing things to combat loneliness. Huh. And the reason I think these things are important, well, there's academic literature to so support the idea that these things are important. And, and I would point people at, um, Ellen Langer has done some fantastic work on the mind-body connection. And there's a researcher whose name I can never pronounce, but there's a book you'll find on Amazon. It's called Loneliness from 2008. Okay. That's a fantastic book if you're interested in these things. And um, I think they're, they're very overlooked in, in the general population as, as contributors to, to, to health. poor health. Yeah. You know, it's not just about the diet. But you quickly get into this problem of, well, how do you change someone's behavior? Right. And like I said before, we've had it very easy up until now working with athletes. But if I want to scale Nourish, Balance, Thrive as a business into other areas, other groups of people who may behave differently from these type like A 40 athletes. 40 to 60% of people, yeah. We have to understand how we're gonna change their behavior. And so I've been very interested looking at, at things like uh, motivational interviewing is uh, something you can, there's lots of really good presentations online if you, and, uh, and so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tool to, a, to enable behavior it's change. It's actually a very popular area of, I guess, innovation in Silicon Valley as well, around digital mm. therapeutics, which are essentially like, coaching people through regimens 
Right, uh, right. I think it's I think it's all kind of um, converging uh, uh, in some ways for like can we do that from interventions like you're developing or through a digital like an app that helps you right right keep social i i think i think there's definitely something there absolutely right yeah so that's what i found is i've gone full circle now is that i reinvented myself as a health and fitness professional but <laughs> as time goes on i'm going back to being a, a computer programmer and right. so i've been here in san francisco attending jeremy howard's fantastic fast.ai training course on machine learning deep learning yeah. and using some of that in our practice. We've collected a lot of data over the past four years. Yeah. And so I've been using some machine learning techniques to predict some of the biomarkers that are otherwise quite expensive to, to do in actuality. Yeah. Uh, and then also doing building some software to interpret blood chemistry. It's kind of a pain to recognize. You know, sometimes I'll look at eight or nine uh, different markers to assess someone's you have ability. You an algorithm now, right? Like it's in your head. You, you know, I know, like, you, I you know. know, like the little the yeah, decision exactly. path. So like exactly. I, automate it, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's what <laughs> I want to do. And, and then, so maybe it's not me, but it's somebody else. So Tommy, for example, who I mentioned, we have this idea of Tommy in a kiosk. Right. So the idea is, imagine Tommy, who's this world-class medical doctor, PhD research scientist, and he's inside of a little kiosk and you've got your blood chemistry. You've just got the results back right. from LabCorp or Quest or wherever you are in the world. And then you feed in this piece of paper into the front of the kiosk. And then Tommy's inside and he looks at it and he like, like annotates it. And yeah. he, he does the diagnosis and tells you what he sees. And then some action items, the right. prescription, what can you do in terms of your diet and lifestyle like to Turing improve this result? Yeah, hey, right? exactly. And then he feeds the piece of paper back out and do there's this, your this, result. This. Yeah. yeah, so what I need to do is make it so that it's not Tommy really in a box. I need to create the software that, that emulates Tommy in a box. Yeah. Um, and so I'm quite excited about working on that in the future. 100%. Well, let's definitely keep in touch. I mean, I think a lot of shared interest here. Yeah, absolutely. I, we'd love to, you know, have you back on when you have a little bit more to share there. I think that's an interesting topic to even explore. I mean, I think there's a, there was like a lot of things I wanted to keep talking about, but I want yeah. to keep this fairly succinct. Um, so I'm sure we'll have Chris back on. Thanks so much to our Facebook live audience. Um, and as always, we're on YouTube, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Apple iTunes. See you guys next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.